uh, we're mindful that, that the headlines from Asia these days, uh, I guess on the front pages anyway, are very much about the Korean Peninsula, about China and whether Xi Jinping really is going to be a leader for life, and about the uh, proposed U.S. tariffs and, and the uh, possibilities of trade wars and all the like, and, and that makes perfect sense. But there is, of course, a little to the west uh, of those countries, a uh, an issue and a country we do need to pay attention to or return attention to if we weren't doing so already. Uh, two months ago, uh, a wave of protests uh, swept several cities in Iran. Um, as you'll hear in a moment, there was much that was different about this uh, round of unrest. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we hear or read almost daily now that whatever patience President Trump had for the sticking to the uh, nuclear deal with Iran uh, seems to be fraying uh, pretty badly. Uh, Iran itself is floating the idea that it may withdraw from the deal, and all of this comes against the backdrop of a, a hugely complex and violent regional struggle pitting Iran uh, in the region against Saudi Arabia. Um, you have Treaty, Treaty Parsi's uh, bio, or you should. Um, I don't want to repeat it all. I'll just make a couple of points about him, which maybe aren't in that bio. First of all, just about every book he writes, um, I see, gets not only great reviews, but some kind of awards. Uh, so I've just bought, and I encourage you to take a look at the same. They're in the back. Uh, Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy. Um, Trita will be signing uh, copies after the program. Uh, his personal history is uh, worth a mention as well. Trita was born in Iran, moved with his family. How, we were four? Four. About four years old. Uh, to Sweden in order to escape political repression. Uh, his father had uh, uh, the distinction, maybe you'd call it, I'm not sure, of having been uh, harassed and detained under uh, the regimes both of the Shah of Iran and then the Ayatollah Khomeini, who, who came after the revolution. Um, we'll have a brief conversation. As I said, it's open to the room and those beyond the room. Uh, for any questions, those watching the live webcast, you can ask your questions via Twitter using the hashtag Asia Society Live or uh, by email, send your questions to moderator at asiasociety.org. Uh, Trita Parsi, welcome back to the Asia Thank Society. Um, I start by asking, uh, now we build this program originally uh, when, we, when we booked your appearance, uh, plain and simple about the protests and what would happen afterwards. Um, I'm mindful now that the nuclear deal, which uh, is never far from the headlines, as I said, has come back with a vengeance. You've made an interesting point recently about the relation between the two. And I wonder if you can start maybe by saying a few words about, well, what the protests were about, in your view, and where there is linkage or a relationship between the protests and what's going on with all this uncertainty about, about the arrangement, the nuclear Definitely. Arrangement. First of all, thank you so much to Asia Society um, for hosting me. I think it was a couple of years ago last, and it was actually in this room. I remember it's a great pleasure to be back. Thank you all for coming and, and uh, defying the Armageddon predictions about <laughs> what would happen today. Um, as to your question, the root causes of the protest in Iran uh, are somewhat complex. You have underlying factors and you have some triggers, of course. The underlying factors were primarily economic and political. You had a tremendous uh, deep frustration in the population with things such as corruption, uh, mismanagement. There was expectations of things moving in the right direction as a result of the nuclear deal that did not uh, materialize. Uh, unemployment is a, a very, very critical factor in all of this. And then you had some triggers with the Rouhani going to the parliament and hinting about what the new budget would look like. And in it, there would be cuts to subsidies. There would be a, a spike in fuel prices. And then you also had a, a financial crisis in which a lot of institutions that were not well regulated uh, were taking people's money and essentially losing them, and people were losing all of their pensions, etc. It's a similar story that we've seen in many other places. All of these different things came together. Uh, only seven or so months after Rouhani won the elections in May of 2017 with roughly 57 percent. And this was quite a surprise mm -hmm. because he managed to uh, quite readily beat the, the conservatives. There was a sense that despite the fact that the eco economy had not really picked up in the way that people had expected following the nuclear deal, that there was still strong support for him, partly because everyone or a very large majority opposed the uh, alternative, which was a return to conservative rule. 
Um, but nevertheless, we, we saw this uh, uh, uprising taking place, these protests, which were very far and widespread. I mean, if you take a look at the difference between what happened there and in, in the Green Movement, the Green Movement was much larger. It was taking place mainly in the main cities in Tehran. This one was much, much smaller, but it was widespread. And we were talking about roughly 100 smaller and mid-sized cities in which this was taking place. It was a different set, uh, demographic as well, uh, working class people out there protesting, whereas the Green Movement was primarily uh, a middle class uh, movement. But there is a connection to the nuclear deal. And the connection there is precisely the expectations of where the economy should have moved to as a result of the deal, and the fact that those expectations were not um, materialized. If you take a look at Iran's economy on paper, it looks as if it's doing quite well. There's a growth of roughly six, six and a half percent. Hmm. Well, that growth is almost entirely because of oil sales. During the sanctions period, Iran's oil sales were more than halved, and as a result of the deal, they're now capable of selling oil again, and it's probably the only area in which they have actually really been able to go back to the pre-sanctioned years. But oil sales do not create jobs. Investments create jobs. And as a result, you've had oil sales, but you have not had the job creation and the types of things that actually lead to people feeling that the economy is moving in a better direction. Just being able to sell the oil and growing 6% actually has not been something that ordinary people have felt in their pocketbooks. And unemployment have actually increased, particularly for young people and particularly for young women. It is at a very, very high rate. Now, why hasn't there been any job creation? Well, the job creation is primarily connected to investments. And there are plenty of projects and plenty of companies that have been very, very interested in going into the Iranian market. They have even signed agreements, but there's a problem. They cannot find financing because none of the major banks are willing to go in and finance these projects out of a fear that Donald Trump is going to kill the deal. Many of these projects are five, seven years long. And the banks, understandably, they're not charities, want to have some degree of security and certainty that the deal will be in place for that period of time so that they're not going to lose their money for investing and financing a project like that. But they can't even get four months of security because Donald Trump is constantly saying that he's going to rip up the deal. And right now his language is that he will do so. He will not renew the waivers. And as a result, it has really uh, ensured that uh, only a fraction of the investments that the government expected have actually materialized. Uh, and there's been, and you mentioned that the Iranians have now started to make noise that they may walk out of the deal. The specific language that the deputy foreign minister used when he was speaking at Chatham House was that if the banks don't come in, then Iran has gained nothing from the deal, and then they will also start walking out. And fascinatingly enough, I think the protests essentially um, tipped the debate inside the White House in December. Because in January was supposed to be another deadline in which the president had to make up his mind whether he was going to renew the waivers. The waivers are the things that inactivates the sanctions for another four months or so. And he's obligated to do so in order for the US to be in compliance with the deal. And many people, myself included, expected him not to renew at this time. But what happened is that inside the White House, the debate was that, you know what? Your strategy of infusing uncertainty into the situation is already working because now you're seeing the protest in Iran. Mm. People are unhappy. All you need to do is just to continue to do what you're doing, which is to constantly make everyone guess, will you or will you not renew the waivers? Even Tillerson and Mattis have no clue what the decision is until the very day of that decision. So if you just continue to do it this way, you are imposing a de facto sanction, because uncertainty is a de facto sanction that is preventing businesses from coming in and is clearly creating economic problems in Iran. We're seeing that as a, uh, with, by virtue of these protests. Um, and as a result, just continue on this path. So my expectation for this time around is that he'll continue to make a lot of noise, that he probably will not do so, but he will never say clearly whether he will or he will not. And last minute, he will probably renew the waivers. But by that time, it really doesn't make any difference, because even a renewal at that moment is meaningless. <laughs>
Can I ask a practical mm -hmm. question? And it's probably something I should know the answer to. But the uh, so the U.S. is obviously not the only party to the deal, and there's a ton of European banks and, and entities that want in, and some are already in. So is there no avenue, from the Iranian perspective, is there no avenue for engagement, for investment? Uh, to, to what extent, what, what happens if, if the U.S. Uh, doesn't renew uh, and, and is out there and the, and the Europeans are all in? As a, as a practical matter for an investor in Iran, what does that mean? For a practical matter um, for an investor in Iran, uh, at the end of the day, if the U.S. is not in and the U.S. decides to reimpose sanctions, those sanctions are not targeting Iran. Those sanctions are targeting countries trading with Iran, which means Europe, China, India, Asia. Um, and if the U.S. does this, the question then is, A, will the Europeans stand firm and continue to honor the deal, and as a result say, we're still going to be in it? And B, does that matter? Because even if the European governments come out and say, we're going to honor the deal, we're going to protect our companies, mm -hmm. And they're already talking about it, even before the steel comment by the president, that they may be reactivating blocking mechanisms, which essentially would mean that if the U.S. sanctions Europe, Europe will sanction the U.S. As a block, these blocking mechanisms existed back in the 1990s as a way of protecting the companies. But even if Europe were to do this, it's not clear whether that would matter because many of the companies are going to be in a situation in which they're going to be asking themselves, if I go into the Iranian market, I will lose access to the American market. Hmm. Will I choose Iran over the U.S. market? I will not. So the European governments can be very firm, but they cannot force their companies to go into the market. And if you end up in a scenario in which the Iranians essentially get none of the economic benefits that justify them making massive concessions on their nuclear program, uh, you're going to see a change in the political dynamic mm -hmm. in Iran. We're already starting to see uh, the initial phases of that, in which the political will on the Iranian side to remain in the deal and to retain the deal will start to weaken. And if you have an administration in Washington that is actively seeking to kill the deal, uh, and an administration in Iran that is also then starting to st think about leaving the deal, then there's not much left of the deal, regardless of what Europe does. Can we come back to the uh, – we, we're all, I think, in this room pretty familiar with the case that was made to the public here uh, when John Kerry and, and the Obama administration negotiated the deal that it, it was all on the basis of security here, obviously. When you talk about the expectations of the Iranian people, can you say a little bit about what was promised in a political public way to them? Was it just a hunch that maybe the investment thing, or were there pledges by President Rouhani and his government that this would mean XXX for jobs, et cetera? Um, there's been plenty of accusations, many of them quite justified, that the Rouhani government and Rouhani himself made very, very grand uh, promises mm -hmm. of what would happen uh, if the deal were to come through, and that that really was the key to fixing uh, the economy and make what he called the wheels of the economy start turning again. Uh, it should also be noted, though, that it wasn't just um, promises from his end to that extent. Even Western officials, in fact, U.S. officials, spoke quite um, clearly about the fact that if once the sanctions are there, there's going to be a, a massive line of companies wanting to go back into uh, Iran, they were also adding to this, perhaps mm -hmm. inadvertently, perhaps as part of a negotiation strategy of trying to increase the value of sanctions relief in the minds of the Iranians. So there were expectations building up on many different fronts. Uh, from the Iranian people's perspective, based on polls, etc., it's quite clear the economic benefits were very, very important. But the general idea of breaking out of the isolation, the general idea of being able to reconnect with the world, the general idea of making sure that this main issue is resolved so that they don't find themselves in a situation in which the risk of war with the U.S. would be a constant presence was a very, very critical thing. Mm -hmm. And that the deal clearly has achieved. Back to the protesters for a moment, Trita. Can you um, uh, speak a little bit about what happened to them or didn't happen to them? What, what was the, the government response? I know it was uh, different in different places, but can you categorize it in any way in terms of repression, uh, the, the reaction generally? 
One of the fascinating things with these protests, not just because they were so different, they started differently from the Green Movement, very different demographic. Part of the reason many people missed this coming, myself included, was because it was driven by a completely different demographic, a demographic that had not been at the center of Iran's political development. It's not for the, the young last... people on the MSN. Not... Well, it was actually very, uh, very young people, mainly young males, but from the working class, uh, not politically experienced and involved very different from the Green Movement. I spoke to organizers of the Green Movement throughout this, and they were taken by surprise of this. They were on the sidelines. They were even somewhat skeptical, mm -hmm. not because they disagreed with the frustrations. In fact, they were very much in agreement that, um, uh, and sympathizing with those frustrations. But they were worried because they saw a leaderless uh, and politically unorganized movement in a post-Syria scenario, which caused them to be very worried that where could this lead? Could this lead to uh, a, a very uh, violent response from the government, which then would be able to fuel something very negative? Uh, but the most, not the most, but one of the more fascinating things in all of this was that not only were there main differences between the Green Movement and these protests, but the response of the government was also very, very different. Now, clearly, there was repression. Uh, more than 25 people were killed in just a few couple of days, and many of them were killed in prison. The official story is that they all committed suicide in prison. I find that hard to believe. Um, so clearly, there was a, a, a tremendous amount of repression. We didn't see as much of it because um, we didn't have a scenario unlike the Green Movement in which it was happening around an election. So there were a lot of Western journalists on the ground. Uh, this time around, that wasn't the case, so um, the, the visuals were not there, but clearly there was repression. But nevertheless, if you take a look at how the Iranian government reacted in 2009 after the fraudulent elections, there was uh, a, a clear accusation that everyone in the Green Movement is just working on behalf of a foreign government, that this is a big conspiracy. This time around, you definitely had some folks on the conservative side who were saying this. But the Rouhani government came out with a much softer line. They were saying the protests have a right to protest, even though they were saying things such as death to the supreme leader, which is a very risky thing to say in Iran, obviously. Um, but they were saying they have a right to protest, even rejecting the idea that they were working on behalf of foreign governments. I think one line that uh, an official from the Rouhani government said was that, well, perhaps some of them are, but most of them are out there because they're angry about their situation. It was quite clear that the government's strategy was to try to defuse the situation by acknowledging that there are legitimate grievances of the population. But also, I think, a political calculation on Rouhani's side that he saw that this is a leaderless uh, movement and that he would be able to co-opt it and actually use their energy against the conservatives. And to a certain extent, that seems to have happened. There's some things that have occurred now uh, that probably would not be happening had it not been for these protests, such as that Rouhani had made a campaign promise that he wanted to push the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, out of the economy, which a lot of people thought, well, this is just a nice promise, something that he's saying to be able to gain votes, but he's not going to be able to make any movement on that at all, mindful of how um, how controlling the IRGC has been of the economy and how um, unwilling they have been to let loose of their grip. But a couple of days, I think uh, a week or two after the protest, apparently Rouhani managed to convince Khamenei, the supreme leader, to issue a decree saying that the military and the IRGC need to divest from the economy. Now, implementation is everything. We don't know how this will be implemented and if it will actually be completely followed through. But the mere fact that that step has been taken, which is very significant because the IRGC's involvement in the economy is a major source mm -hmm. of the corruption, a major source of the mismanagement. And it's also a major source of their growing undemocratic power. Mm -hmm. The fact that that issue was decreed is quite fascinating. And I personally don't believe that it would have happened had it not been for the protests, protests that did shake this government, particularly the hardliners, because the young working class, that's actually the base, that's the mm -hmm. constituency of the hardliners uh, in the government. So th these are protests that are coming from their own grassroots. Um, and I think it made uh, the upper echelons of the 
elite realize that some significant changes were needed. And remind us, if you can, what, what the demographic is, uh, the, just the population that's under 30 or something like that. I'm always blown away by that, that figure. I mean, It's a figure that um, has become a bit outdated, though. For a very long time, people have been saying, look, Iran is a very, very young country. 50 percent are they, under. They're getting older? They're getting older. <laughs> Uh, and, it's, and, and it has significant political impact as well. Uh, they're getting older. They've pushed down the birth rate significantly to the extent that they're now trying actively to reverse it. Um, so it is not the same young country that brought Khatami to power in 1997. Mm -hmm. It is actually older. That They're more focused on jobs and that type of security compared to 20 years ago where perhaps political rights and things like that were a little bit more uh, on the forefront. Uh, but it's still obviously um, uh, a major problem for the youth in Iran because in the absence of job creation, youth unemployment continues to be very high, combined with the fact that this is a highly educated population. Mm -hmm. So you have a major problem with a lot of people with two master's degrees driving the Iranian version of Uber mm -hmm. for work. So the expectation gap with such an educated population, but such an incompetent management of the economy that doesn't create jobs is a major um, um, uh, problem that is going to continue to be a problem. And, and just because these protests have essentially calmed down for now, unless there are some significant economic reforms that addresses many of these concerns, I don't think at all this government should feel comfortable that the anger is gone. The anger is just temporarily um, um, been put aside right now, and I think the population is waiting to see what will happen. And there may very well soon be another trigger. We're going to have um, the um, uh, once the full budget is uh, fully presented and adopted, we're going to see what's going to be in it, what has changed, etc. And then you may have another trigger point for protest. So uh, we're opening it up to the room. I just have one more question, but if you can tee up your own, uh, we'll spend the rest of the hour with those. You've now uh, touched a couple of times, Trita, on the potential for change in, in Iran. You've said recently that despite all the problems we've identified, you've identified absence of investment, unemployment, everything else that you are, that's maybe not the right term, but you're bullish on change coming in significant ways to the country. Can you explain what you mean and, and why you say it? I am. I am optimistic in the long run, though Iran is going to be facing some very, very significant problems uh, in the short and the medium term. And part of the reason I am is actually because of the society. I think in Washington we have been too focused on governments and seeing governments as the only important aspect of countries, and that focus has come at the expense of societies. And Iran is a very, very vibrant society. Uh, the change that has come so far, and there's been some important change in reform, has come because of the grassroots and the societies pushing and changing these things. You have a scenario now in which um, the parliament is, has adopted or uh, is um, about to adopt a change in the Iranian uh, execution laws in which you can no longer impose capital punishment for um, uh, drug offenses, which according to human rights organizations will likely reduce the number of executions in Iran with 80%. Wow. Iran right now is one of the countries that executes most, country, uh, most people in the world, right next to China and Saudi Arabia. Now, where did that change come from? Well, primarily came from grassroots and NGOs inside of Iran who's been waging a very, very long campaign for this change, with some help from European governments who've been pressing the Iranians on this issue. I'll give you a couple of other examples. In the 2017 elections, uh, obviously over here we focus on what's happening in the presidential elections, and the presidential elections are not free and fair. You have the Guardian Council that is interfering in these elections and vetting candidates based on criteria that they don't even make public any longer. It's a very undemocratic feature in, in their system. On a more local level, at the city councils, the Guardian Council doesn't have the mandate or the capacity to get itself involved in all of those elections. There we see much more direct representation. And in the last election, and the city councils are important, they're the ones who elect the mayors, and mayors tend to be quite uh, powerful in Iran. Um, the, in the last election, the number of women who took seats in the city councils, I believe, tripled or quadrupled. Mm. In the main cities, Tabriz, Shiraz, Esfahan, Tehran, the reformists, not even the centrist with Rouhani, but the reformists, the green movement essentially, cleaned the slate, took every seat. Wow. 
in the city of Mashhad, which is a very conservative city, it's the city, home city of the supreme leader, it's the home city of the main conservative rival of Rouhani in the presidential elections, there was a woman who ran on a campaign of opposing the patriarchy. Her slogan was, elect more women. She won. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing building blocks of a much, much more democratic uh, system coming from inside society itself that is pushing slowly in that direction. Clearly, it's not a linear line. Clearly, they're suffering major setbacks here and there. But compare that to a lot of other societies in the Middle East, mm -hmm. I see far more of those building blocks, far more of a reason to believe that peaceful, gradual, controllable change can come precisely because of the values and because of the dynamics of the Iranian society. I don't see that, unfortunately, in many other places in the region right now. Okay. On that note, uh, are there questions in the room for Trita Parsi? Uh, yes, sir. If you can just say who you are and, and keep it relatively brief, would be great. Sure. Uh, I'm Ali Ashrafi. Um, so I have a question for you on the long-term uh, direction of pol politics in Iran. So. Um, I was in Iran actually at the time of the protest, but uh, the way I see it, essentially you have a camp in politics and in society that believes in constructive interaction with the West and that having fruits and results, right? And there's a camp that believes, I, and I think Khamenei is in that camp, that thinks the US and, the West and Europe to some extent will never come through. And so it's better to just have a strategic relationship with Russia and China and be on that side. Um, with Iran deal being on life support and maybe not even that in a short <laughs> while, um, what do you see the effects of that in terms of the lo long-term alignment of politics in Iran? Excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, this is a very important question because what will happen now with the Iran deal will have a significant impact on who inside the Iranian elite, which camp will win out on this. And this is important, because if you take a look at the Iranian narrative, the way they see their own interaction with the West for the last four decades, you have had a camp who very strongly believed, look, the West will never accept the Islamic Republic. They will never accept Iran as a major power in the region. Iran has the potential to be so powerful in the region that that is a threat to Saudi Arabia, to Israel, and other countries in the region that are US allies. And as a result, the West will always seek to have a balance in the region that essentially is based on Iran's containment and isolation. Um, and it doesn't matter what Iran does. It doesn't matter if it compromises. It doesn't matter uh, if it changes its policies. The fundamental balance of power calculation on the Western side will not change. And as a result, it will always face that problem. Then you have a camp that says no, through compromise, there can be coexistence, as the Iranian foreign minister says all the time, there can be win-win solutions. Ultimately, real security in the region will not be achieved unless you have an inclusive security architecture. We have to work in that front. And they kind of got the momentum as a result of Rouhani's election, and they were essentially enabled to drive the ship and pursue the nuclear deal. And the nuclear deal has now become a test case, the ultimate test case mm -hmm. for this battle between these two mindsets inside the elites. You have massive concessions given by the Iranians on the nuclear front. You know, their centrifuges were cut down from 22,000 to 5,000. Their LEU count, the low enriched uranium stockpile that they had, was cut down from 10,000 kilos to always being less than 400, essentially 98% or so out. Closed down all of their nuclear reactors or facilities with the exception of one in Atans. Massive concessions that have been given on this front. And in return, it was supposed to be economic concession uh, uh, benefits given to them. but. A more important thing was perhaps the more implicit um, concession, which is an acceptance that Iran is a player, a major player in the region, that it needs to be included in all of the security dialogues, that it needs to be included in the infrastructure, political and eco economic in, Iran, uh, in the region, and have that seat at the table. And this was very clear and visible immediately after the deal, when suddenly the Geneva conversations on Syria which Iran had not been part of, now the US insisted Iran has to have a seat at that table, because no solution can be found unless Iran is there as well. Mm -hmm. Not that it would guarantee a solution, but its absence would essentially guarantee a failure. This was a 180-degree shift in mm -hmm. the American policy. 
Since 1979, the U.S. has been seeking Iran's isolation. Now the U.S. was the country that was insisting that Iran has mm -hmm. to be at the table. And as long as the deal seemed to be working, it seemed like that camp had been proven right. If Iran compromised, the West would compromise as well. Then a certain TV reality star won the elections in the United States, and things are starting to change again. Because now he ran on a campaign of opposing the deal. Everything that has been done so far has been aimed at undermining the deal. The U.S. arguably is already in violation of the deal. There's not been a single OFAC license issued since Trump came into power. And if the OFAC license to Boeing is not renewed, then the U.S. will be in clear violation of the deal because the Boeing contract is actually written into the JCPOA. Hmm. And incidentally, immediately after the Obama administration struck the deal, it did something that I think that many of them perhaps in retrospect regret. They felt that they had to go on a tour and compensate U.S. allies in the region for having struck the nuclear deal, which included massive more arms sales to Saudi Arabia, for instance. So while Iran cuts down on its nuclear program, its pathways to a bomb is closed, the conventional military balance actually further shifts against Iran because the Saudis were already outspending Iran with a factor of five on weapons, and that increased further. <clears throat> and now you see a scenario in which, from the perspective of the, the Saudis and the Israelis and the UAE, they are working quite... Um, um, uh, actively to try to undermine the deal, and the narrative in Iran likely will change now and say, well, even after Iran did all of these compromises, even after the U.S. itself accepted it, it turned out that the conservatives were right because they were already back then saying, you can't trust this deal anyways because Obama is not a f true reflection of the United States. Obama is the exception. He is not the norm. And as soon as he's out of office, things will go back to the way it was before. If that narrative essentially takes hold, uh, and wins out because the deal collapses, because we return to an all-out isolation policy, then um, I think it's pretty safe to say that the other school will be in dominance in Iran. And that will mean not only that there will be a shift towards Russia and China, but I suspect also a much, much tougher policy in the region because the Iranians will then say, look, the only reason why the West didn't accept is because Iran actually wasn't forceful enough. And in, in, it's going to move in that direction instead. And I'll add one point that is connected to North Korea. Particularly if you have a scenario, and I want to preface this by saying I'm a big supporter of diplomacy, so please don't take this as a, uh, an argument against diplomacy with North Korea. But particularly if you end up having diplomacy with North Korea right now in which some sort of agreement is reached, mm. which I hope is the case, I would suspect that there's going to be voices in Iran who says Iran's main mistake was that it only had enrichment. Mm. If it had nuclear weapons, the United States would have struck a deal, it would have honored a deal, and it would have given Iran respect. But Iran made a mistake because it went to the negotiating table only with 10,000 kilos of LU, but no action nuclear weapon. Mm. I think that would be a very dangerous scenario because we're essentially incentivizing countries to go for a nuclear weapon. Oh, on that happy note, question from this side. I'm Teddy Loxin. I'm the ambassador to the United Nations. Welcome, Ambassador. I I'd seen like to uh, bring back the subject to the discussion to the subject of the protests themselves um, and uh, in, ask you what factors you find similar to the Philippine People Power Revolution, mm. so called, um, and if any of them obtained in Iran. The first was it was church led uh, and Western media attended. We were the darlings of the Western media. It was led by a religious conservative from the country's biggest landlord family, which attested to her anti-communist credentials. Um, and uh, it was stopped off by a military revolt, self-consciously imitating the flower revolution in Portugal, led by well, the good-looking tank commander, Otelo de Saraiva. Uh, those things were self-consciously done. The, the protests were led by priests and nuns, and um, so it appealed to the conservative element in Philippine society. But like Iran, it was attended by corruption, cronyism, uh, financial mismanagement, and the window dressing of the central bank reserves. Um, of course, all of this triggered by the assassination of the <clears throat> Catholic woman's husband mm. himself from the landed elite. Do you see any connection here? But I must tell you this, I went to Iran, and indeed it is a highly 
anecdotally, highly educated population. The women speak freely. Um, they don't dress that conservatively. And um, uh, I noticed that they, have, they speak their own minds and have no fear. Mm -hmm. So this will be an added element that we probably did not have in our country. Interesting. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I didn't see any direct parallels, to be completely frank with you. This was not led by anyone, frankly. This was um, rather disorganized. This was truly just uh, uh, an expression of deep, deep frustrations of the population having reached a tipping point. And this is, again, part of the reason why some folks on the Green Movement were quite worried about it, because a movement that doesn't have that type of a leadership, how do you channel that energy into a political ask? And how do you make sure that you negotiate with the power in order to be able to get changes in the absence of leadership? Um, so I didn't see you know, the, 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 the mosque or the church being at the forefront of this. What is, as a small anecdote, is what is fascinating that the protest actually started in the city of Mashhad, which was organized by hardliners as an anti-Rohani protest. Because as part of what Rouhani had done when he had gone to the parliament is that he had started to speak openly and freely about the fact that there are these huge black holes in the Iranian state budget, which is a bunch of money that the state is giving to all of these religious institutions that are controlled by the hardliners, that is not regulated, that is not transparent, and it is disabling Iran from actually being able to for having an effective economy because so much of the money is just quietly being shifted away to all of these conservative institutions. This, of course, angered the conservatives to no end because he was going after their pocket money right now. So they organized it, but they miscalculated because they did not recognize that the economic frustrations amongst the general population was so deep. So once people saw protests, they all joined. And what started off as orchestrated anti-Rouhani slogans very quickly turned into all-out anti-government and anti-regime protests, including targeting the supreme leader himself. So this was a massive miscalculation by the hardliners. And again, it shows actually how this, this, these protests lacked leadership. Um, so when it comes to that point, you, you see a very different uh, perspective. When it came to uh, how the Western media would focus on it, etc., certainly protests in Iran do tend to get uh, quite a lot of attention. This time around, because of Telegram and other apps, uh, it was quite easy to be able to spread the word about these things. And at one point, the Iranian government closed down that app altogether. There were elements on the outside. I want to be very clear. I personally have not seen evidence to say that this was orchestrated from the outside or it was initiated from the outside. But there were clearly elements on the outside who tried to either ride that wave or try to take control over it. And there were some that were actually propagating using violence. Uh, and you saw that on the ground a little bit with a lot of banks being burnt down, attacks against uh, various uh, government institutions. Uh, Telegram closed down their channels b precisely because they were using those channels to be able to teach people how to do Molotov cocktails, etc. So you had an element of that. But I've seen no evidence to say that it was driven from the outside, orchestrated from the outside. Bottom line is there are very deep and legitimate economic grievances, over cronyism, mismanagement, et cetera, which created that powder <coughs> keg. Um, and anyone from the outside trying to take control of it at best could only create the optics of being in control, but truly not really being in control, I would say. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. My name is Paul Moyer. <coughs> Uh, arrested over the past few months uh, mm -hmm. and locked up, etc. And I'm wondering what you think the in in the context of uh, this very delicate political situation in Iran at the moment, what you think the responsibility and correct response of both human rights groups and diplomats should be, which would presumably assist both those incarcerated and also not uh, inflame the atmosphere further? Yeah. I think that's a very important question. This is a question that is close to my heart because two of my close friends are in jail in Iran right now, and they've been so for more than two years. Uh, Bagh Namazi is 
uh, I think by now 81, 82, and in, in very bad health. Uh, doctors insist that he should be uh, at the hospital. Uh, he's only been given respite to be able to visit the hospital for a week, uh, whereas they say that he should stay there for at least three months, mindful of his health. I firmly believe that both he and uh, his son, Siamak, are completely innocent and that there are currently pawns in a game that is being played, both internally inside of Iran, but also vis-a-vis -vis the United States. We've seen in the past that cases of this kind, and there's several uh, dual nationals, and there's some Iranians that are also arrested uh, on sanctions charges and other charges in the West, that this was only resolved through a prisoner swap. Um, and most of them have been very quiet. Some of them have gotten a little bit more attention. Um, uh, one that, of course, got more attention was the one that coincided with the implementation of the nuclear deal in January 2016, uh, which was um, uh, partly, of course, because Jason Rezaian, a very high-profile case, uh, was involved in that. Once the Trump administration came into place, there were plenty of dual nationals in jail in Iran. They showed no interest in pursuing any back-channel negotiations. Later on, they have, um, but it's come in a context in which it's not really clear whether they have the capacity to pursue that diplomacy. There's not been any clear signal of sincerity for diplomacy, mindful of everything else that is going on. And all of those things have made the situation for the dual nationals much, much worse. I think it is critical that attention is continuously given to their cases, that this is not forgotten. I think it is critical that countries that have the capacity to mediate and be able to facilitate talks between the United States and Iran uh, for a prisoner swap or any type of other arrangement uh, that would ensure uh, that they are uh, released, uh, that they do take place. And this is also, again, what I'm worried, because uh, the current administration has not necessarily been particularly charitable to the countries who helped in the past release, um, uh, win the release of Americans between the US and Iran, because they were also involved in securing the nuclear deal. And the Trump administration has not treated them particularly well. We do need these mediators. And if we don't treat them well, we're not going to have any. So I'm very, very concerned about this situation. I'll add one other concern. As much as I would like to see, and I think it's absolutely necessary to see nuclear, uh, to see talks for a prisoner swap to be able to win the release, I am at the same time quite worried. I'm not entirely sure that the current team in the US has the capacity and the skills to be able to conduct such a negotiation. Mm -hmm. It will take a tremendous amount of finesse, as well as patience and diplomatic skills. Um, and one tweet from the president can sabotage months, if not years, of work on f something like this. And, and I find that very worrisome. We have something that may serve as a follow-up from uh, somebody watching and sending this online, very elegantly phrased question. There's a saying that it's a very broad one, too. Uh, there's a saying that repression works until it doesn't. Does it seem like Iran is reaching a tipping point? There's probably another saying that says that we constantly think Iran is at a tipping point for the last 40 years, and it hasn't. <laughs> um, so I want to be a bit careful. Um, I think there are definitely trends in Iran that are going to be very difficult for uh, the government to be able to handle uh, that are not necessarily all related to the repression, which is clearly there, but are uh, an underlying factor. And, and one of those, of course, is climate change, which is affecting Iran in an extremely, extremely negative way right now. They don't have the capacity to be able to handle that. There's going to be massive uh, internal movements of people. Um, and parts of the country is not going to be inhabitable in, in the next decade or so, unless something dramatically shifts. Uh, areas where Iran is growing its food and it's largely self-reliant on food is hard as hit. So you're going to have massive economic consequences of that as well. The government is not particularly well placed to even handle the current degrees of problems. Mm -hmm. If you add these problems to it, it's going to be even more challenging. But on the other hand, you also have a scenario in which the society, uh, again, is sophisticated and has learned not only from its own mistakes, but also from the mistakes of others. It's learned its mistake from the 1979 revolution, that when you do a revolution, you know who you're revolting against, but you don't know who you're revolting for. Mm 
and you end up oftentimes replacing one bad government with another bad government. Um, secondly, after Syria, it's also very clear that if you opt for fast change that is uncontrol uncontrollable, it can end up becoming violent, and you don't just lose what you had, you lose the country as a whole. I mean, who on earth would want to be in the scenario of the Syrian people today? Mm -hmm. So these things are also causing a degree of restraint on people and making sure that they don't go too far in that direction. Um, so again, I think it makes it very difficult to be able to talk about tipping points. Again, just look what happened roughly a year ago. You had very high participation in the elections and 57 percent um, uh, voting for Rouhani. So you have clear signals and trends that people do recognize the dangers of going in a much more radical, fast change approach, but you also have underlying factors that are going to make the current problems in Iran much, much more severe in the next decade. We have a few more online, but I'm partial to those in the room. Yes. If you can just turn the mic on. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned earlier that um, a lot of oil can't base oil can't lead to sustain sustainability in Iran, and I'm I was reading earlier that even Saudi Arabia began to you know give you know women the ability to drive, but a lot of that is what female activists are saying is to essentially diversify and uh, drive the economy in Saudi Arabia um, because oil is not sustainable, and with such a highly educated. Uh, young population in Iran, where do you think that if there was to be investment or industry growth, mm. what regions do you think that would be in? So, so if I understand the question, if there were to be investments in Iran... Not, so, if because you, you said oil is not a job producing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, any, where, where would you see or encourage investment to go to given the high level of education, oh, okay. is that right? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, when the Iranian economy opened up, uh, after the nuclear deal was essentially the biggest economy since the fall of Soviet Union. So there's hardly any place that, that couldn't be invested in. You have uh, a very wide scale of areas that uh, are open for investment. Everything. The Iranians already have the world's sixth largest car industry. Um, you have that. You have a, a growing IT sector. Almost every app that exists here, there's like an Iranian version of it over there. They have their own Ubers, they have their own Groupons, etc. So there's a tremendous amount of areas in which investments could come in. And I think in technology in particular, uh, it would be quite valuable <coughs> for further gender equality because you have a very large number. In fact, more women, already 60% of uh, the university students in Iran are women, but they're even a majority in the engineering fields right now. Um, so th there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and potential over there. But the main obstacles right now, again, are the government's own mismanagement, the corruption, cronyism, and, of course, the problem with the sanctions and the uncertainty that creates. Anyone else in the room? Yes, sir. Uh, it's my impression that uh, most Americans uh, support uh, uh, Trump's point of view about Iran. Uh, uh, the few programs that I watch on television seem to indicate that even the pundits uh, blame uh, Iran for uh, uh, things that happen in the Middle East. I don't know exactly what they're referring to, except that they mentioned the word uh, bad behavior. I've heard that, that expression so, so many times. What accounts for the fact that, that there is this hostility among the American people toward uh, Iran, and uh, is it propaganda by certain groups, or is it uh, uh, memories of uh, what happened uh, when uh, the uh, diplomats were uh, uh, kept in the embassy? Uh, what, what accounts for, for this anti-Iranian sentiment? Thank you. Um, let me tell you what I think doesn't account for it. It's not the American people. The American people are not known for having particularly long memories. So they need to be constantly reminded in order to keep Iran in that area of their mind as a hostile enemy, etc. So it's not coming from the people itself going in that direction. Um, but I, I very much appreciate your question because it gives me an opportunity to talk about the title of my book, Losing an Enemy. What happened in the process after the deal was struck, that it became very, very clear. There are elements in Washington. There are elements in Tehran. There are certainly elements in Tel Aviv and in Riyadh who much prefer that the United States and Iran remain enemies 
uh, who don't want to lose this enemy because um, of a variety of different reasons, including geopolitical, but also certain institutional uh, interests that exist. So particularly if you take a look now, um, what is being said about the nuclear deal, et cetera. We went from a period of almost 25 years of hearing the nuclear deal being an existential threat, particularly to Israel. The issue was resolved, and instead of having a thank you card from Netanyahu to Obama for actually having made sure that Iran has no pathways to nuclear bomb, instead we have more problems because now it's missiles or it's Iran's behavior, etc. You see that there's a deeper geopolitical problem here, but also from the perspective of some U.S. allies in the region. They want the United States to remain engaged in the region. They want the United States to have a policy of an all-out isolation and containment of Iran, because if that doesn't happen, the balance of power in the region will naturally shift. And it will come at the expense of some of those countries who have benefited from the U.S.'s presence in the region, whose maneuverability in the region has been at virtue of American power. They themselves do not have the capacity. Saudi Arabia does not have the capacity to balance Iran. But when the United States is involved as a power that is seeking Iran's all-out isolation, then Saudi Arabia has far greater maneuverability and influence in the region. They don't want to lose that. They want to keep the U.S. and Iran enmity in place because it is very beneficial for them from a geopolitical perspective. What you're I, saying has been said by uh, uh, Israeli uh, cabinet ministers. Yeah, they, they, I, I think 10, 15 years ago, this would sound as perhaps a, um, um, a difficult explanation to grasp. But at this point, this is quite open, um, uh, that this is the, the ultimate uh, driving force of this uh, conflict. And I think from the American perspective, the question that needs to be asked is, how does this actually benefit U.S. interest in the region? Is the United States supposed to be in the region as a proxy of some of its allies and fight their battles? I mean, there's a quote from former Bob Gates uh, in a private conversation with the French foreign minister or defense minister, uh, which wasn't unearthed until WikiLeaks uh, released some of those cables in which he said the Saudis want to fight the Iranians to the last American. Well, is that something <laughs> that is in the interest of the United States? Um, I don't think it is. I think we have to have a, a conversation about what is our own value of our presence in the region. Mm -hmm. Do we think that in the long run, uh, a, a policy, an order in the region that is based on not indigenous forces that can sustain it, but based on the U.S. essentially pumping money and arms into the region in order to uphold it, A, if it's durable, uh, if it's valuable from the U.S. perspective. Clearly from the Obama administration's perspective, it was not. They believed that the U.S. was overextended in the Middle East. It needed, needed to shift its focus to Asia, a pivot to Asia. Um, and they believed that, ultimately, uh, it was impossible to forever put Iran in a straitjacket, but rather it was much more beneficial for stability in the region to try to find ways to reintegrate Iran into the security architecture by, at the same time, ensuring that its policies in the region changed. And the nuclear deal was a very important test case because Iran changed its nuclear policy. The question is, can we have further negotiations for a new security architecture in the region in which Iranian policies in Yemen and in, in Syria and Iraq mm -hmm. also could change in exchange for greater acceptance and involvement and integration of Iran? That's a proposition, I think, that is worth pursuing, partly because it's far less costly than what the U.S. is doing right now. Uh, it is the only method that we've seen actually has been successful in changing Iran's policies uh, in an effective way. It's through this multilateral negotiations. Everything else we've tried in the last 40 years have actually only made things worse mm. and, and gotten the Iranians to uh, dig in their heels even further. The only time we actually got a real compromise from them was through this diplomatic effort. Time for one more. I'll try to um, end this on a positive note. Uh, good to see you good here luck. again. <laughs> but, you know, over the years, you know, all the, I mean, setting political rhetoric aside, uh, the public opinion, right, the Iranians' public opinion has sort of like been very favorable towards U.S. Do you see that still being the case? And would that serve as a silver lining in U.S. US relations going forward? It's a great question, and just to repeat the basis of it, um, 
despite the very, or perhaps because of the very negative relations between the governments to U.S. and Iran, the population has actually held a very different view of the U.S. They're not particularly favorable towards U.S. foreign policy. I want to be very clear on that. But they have a very favorable view of the United States, U.S. culture, the United States people, uh, uh, and values. The question is, if this whole thing collapses, uh, will it also change? And will the United States lose the soft power asset that he has in the sense of the Iranian people having positive views of the United States, which is not necessarily the case for many other places in the region? I think to a certain extent, it not only depends on what happens with the nuclear deal, but it also depends on whether Donald Trump ends up becoming the norm or the exception. If it ends up being the norm, then I fear that you're going to have a lot of people in Iran who are going to be more driven towards the hardline narrative, who essentially says, look, the West and the U.S. is just inherently anti-Iran. There's nothing you can do about it. You can only defend yourself. Um, and I want to bring attention to three things that Donald Trump already has done that has already caused people to um, have a very, very, very negative view of him, at least, and his policies. Three things that have happened that have really, and we're not talking about the government now, we're talking about the people. First of all, the opposition to the nuclear deal. The nuclear deal is very, very popular amongst the people, uh, and they saw it as a way of breaking out of their isolation, a way of avoiding war with the US. That's one. Secondly, what was the first thing he did within the first 10 days that he came into office? He imposed a Muslim ban that overwhelmingly targeted Iranian nationals. It was the biggest nationality that was affected by this essentially assuming that all Iranians are terrorists while doing nothing when it comes to many of the U.S. allies that actually have been quite involved in targeting U.S. on its own soil. The third thing is the one that probably most people have not paid much attention to, which is that in June of 2017, there was, for the first time, an ISIS attack deep inside of Iran, hitting Tehran, mm -hmm. uh, killing uh, two or so dozen people. That's the first time not only that ISIS manages to hit Iran so deep into the country, they've tried but they've failed, but it was also the first time I saw the White House issue a statement after an ISIS attack in which they actually blamed the victim and kind of gave ISIS a pass. It was only a two-sentence statement coming out of the White House that essentially said Iran is reaping what it sow. And I've never seen an example of that in the past in which ISIS is striking, killing innocent people, and the U.S. has that type of a response. Hmm. And rest assured, for ordinary Iranians who are then seeing ISIS uh, attacking them on their soil and seeing that type of response from the U.S. president, it did not sit down well at all. Uh, that question was meant to uh, put us somehow on a happier note, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, he did his best. I did my best yeah. <laughs> Just a quick word before we uh, break up. First of all, again, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'll repeat the invitation for those who arrived a little later. Uh, the great show in the galleries, the meditation session at 1230, Julie Bishop uh, from Australia at 2, and of course, any other programs, come to AsiaSociety.org. Uh, the next Asia briefing. Now, if you think Iran is complicated, um, we, by the way, we invite any of you and our membership to suggest topics or people to come uh, for these monthly get-togethers. Uh, we had a couple of folks uh, uh, independently come in and say, you've never done anything here on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. So uh, that's correct. Uh, and we are going to uh, uh, do that as our next one. It's the 4th of April, um, first Wednesday in April. And in addition to a complicated subject, we have a fantastic guest who I've heard speak many times. You may have seen him on television. Uh, Michael Novogratz, who is a sort of legendary hedge fund investor here, uh, who is now uh, head of uh, Galaxy Investment and uh, uh, starting a big cryptocurrency fund. So a completely different subject. I'm not sure it could be any more different, uh, but if you're interested in that. And for that one, you've got to be in the room because uh, it's off the record. So uh, uh, no webcast then. Hopefully the weather will be better. I thank you all. Trita Parsi, that was a fabulous hour. Really thank you. It. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming.